Welcome, guys, to this next episode of the Trainer Feed. We are your hosts. I am Angel Sanchez. We have Jacques Delager. What's going on, everybody? Happy and then Friday. We, we got David Bravo over here. What's up? <laughs> um, we have a guest today, Mr. Dan Rohan. But before we introduce our guest, uh, let's see how everybody's doing. David, how you doing? I'm tired. Like, I just got back from a workout. I was at the club earlier for some clients, and I'm ready to go to bed. At two o'clock. All right, there you go. Some some people <laughs> are napping pros. That's true. That's. True. I heard that's a skill in the medical field as well. That's right. For you know, for Jacques, if I'm not being nap. productive, I'm like a waste. And a no, no, I think naps I'm just are important. jealous because I can't nap. I'm jealous, honestly. Oh. Deep down, I'm just like okay. I can never nap because you're productive and I'm not. It's, no, nah, naps it's are productive. Great. <laughs> no, I, I'm ge- genuinely My naps jealous. become like hour-long nap. naps. Oh, man. I'm like, oh, sure. Wake up the next day. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> next day. <laughs> Doc, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. Uh, I Some of the David came back from walking out not long ago, but it's fucking cold today, man. Like, you forget when you have to walk the dog in the cold, you think, damn, I, I'm glad I don't have to use the restroom outside because it was Just get a 10-foot get a 10-foot leash and just, like, put it out the window. Reel it back in. Yeah, uh, from fourth floor up. <laughs> yeah. 20 foot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Rains be seen. How about you, Angel? How are you feeling? I'm doing doing well. Doing well. It's a little chilly, but we're here. It's January. Actually, it's about to be February, so. It's almost it's Super crazy. Bowl time. It's about that time. Almost Super Bowl time. Chiefs and are taking it. Valentine's Day. The Chiefs are ready. The Chiefs Valen- are take it. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Van Halen. Van Halen, he died, bro. Damn, RIP. All right, so let's introduce our guest, Dan Rohanna. He is a ex <clears throat> pro, uh, personal trainer, uh, fitness enthusiast, and educator. So give it up for Dan. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Hey, Dan, how you doing? What's going on, guys? What's uh, up, Dan? Nice to meet you. Uh, sorry, Dave, was for Dave. What's going on, Jack? How you been? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. How's everything up there? Same, <laughs> yeah. cold as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> where, yeah, where are we you? got some of that today. Uh, we're, we're in Western PA right now, so like just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, we were down in Miami, which was nice to kind of get away from all the all the cold. But uh, it's been pretty cold since we got back. Was fortunate to get out a few times on the on the mountain, do a little snowboarding, so that made it a little bit better. Oh, but, that's uh, awesome. Today's a cold day, man. I heard you guys got it pretty bad up north there though, too. So cold, cold wise, yeah. It's thank you. Didn't snow, yeah, but it's crazy. Yeah. I heard you guys got like it almost feels like uh, like ten degrees or something. Yeah, it's that typical so, nineteen yeah. feels like nine. You're like, okay, so it was actually nine, or was it nineteen? You know. Yeah. But, right. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to thank you for coming on the podcast today, um, and I think it's best if you kind of like give everybody, give our listeners, kind of a recap as to how you got into fitness um, and personal training. So uh, feel free to jump in with your bio. How'd you get to the spot where you're at right now? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. I uh, appreciate it. I've uh, just been, had a chance to actually go through a lot of the, some of the previous shows and a lot of good stuff on there. So Thank I'm you. now a fan. Thank you. I'm now a trainer feed fan. Uh, nice. That's funny. Thank you. I was definitely hooked on a lot of the conversations. So really cool. Uh, <clears throat> so for me, I think most of you guys know this. I've been in, in sports uh, pretty much my whole life. So I think that's probably the biggest foundation that kind of took me this way. Uh, I was able to, you know, I was fortunate enough to play sports up, you know, um, into the pros for a little bit, which basically meant I was playing until I was about 26, 27. Uh, Cinderella story got cut a little bit shorter or quicker than I would have liked, but that's all right. Uh, But that's kind of how I got there. Um, For me, like, you know, I played, you know, and it's just hockey, and I played hockey kind of all the way up, you know, as a kid, but I took a lot of breaks. So for me, fitness was a big way to kind of bridge a lot of those gaps. So the idea of, you know, shooting 200 pucks a day or, doing dry land training, then hitting the gym, and then uh, coming back and stretching for an hour, you know, uh, really is what kind of allowed me to just kind of maintain and, and hang around as long as I did. You know, so I've, I've always kind of pushed that, and I was always looked to as the guy that was just, uh, you know, kind of knew what to do when it came to the gym. So a lot of guys were always kind of gravitating towards me. So I was read, I was, I was uh, leading little kind of like group training programs with all my teammates and friends kind of going through it. You know, after I was done playing, jumped into uh, 
the financial world, jumped into the corporate business world for a minute. Uh, anybody who's been there can tell you that that's a different place than the sports world. Uh, so it, uh, it was cool. It wasn't for me. Got back in, you know, it's always love training. So I was like, let me try this out. And uh, so I, I you know, this is when I came to New York back in 2010, I think is when I first went to the Reebok Club, which is now Equinox. And uh, I was like, hey, this is Reebok. Yeah, it's got a cool name. I want to train here. So I uh, kind of jumped in there, got my feet wet, had some uh, success. At the same time, I was doing a little bit of fitness modeling, just trying to like really kind of feel out what it is that I was going to do going forward. And uh, just kind of had the same side, of, same kind of success uh, right away with training people as I did kind of, like I said, back in the day with, with my teammates and everything. And that, that was kind of cool because it was the same kind of idea. Just, you know, it comes down to working hard. I think we all can all agree on that. It comes down to consistency and working hard, right? It's showing up when you're like, don't really want to be here, but I'm going to do it anyways, you know? And the only person that's going to give you credit for it is you, right? You know, so sometimes it's just like, how am I going to do this? Why am I going to do this? But just kind of taking that overall philosophy, you know, just like I said, with sports was kind of like, all right, you know, these kids kind of got a, a head start on you. How are you going to catch up? Well, I'm going to do the things that they're not doing, you know? And, and in, in fitness, I think, you know, you're really seeing a lot of that now is it's like, you know, when I first got into it, unless you were an athlete, you probably weren't doing a dynamic warm up or spending a lot of time warming up. Uh, you probably weren't doing like, you know, stretching afterwards for, you know, an extra 30 minutes. You probably weren't doing a cardio session and a training session, you know, because it was just like, oh, that's just too much. We don't do that. We're going to hit the weight room and that's how we're going to do this. So that was interesting. And then, of course, obviously the philosophy now is like everybody's just any little inch or opportunity, that's what everybody's about right now. And that's great. You know, and I, I love seeing it now because that's really what it takes. You know, I still think there's some stigmas out there we can help as far as uh, the diet and everything go, you know, with helping people kind of find their path because I still think there's a lot of confusion. Um, but that kind of brought me up to, you know, like I said, uh, sports is really kind of what got me here. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. So. No, that's that's awesome. I think that uh, you touched on a few things there, uh, taking the athlete's mindset and starting to utilize that mindset in the health and fitness world with your clients. Uh, and I'm sure that you've seen some boundaries that you probably didn't see in the strength and conditioning, like sports and athletic world. And then some things that were really familiar, right? Like maybe even some body image issues and challenges in that regard. And you spoke about uh, scheduling and making sure that even though you don't want to do it, just getting in there and getting it done. Um, I did want to kind of like pivot towards something a little bit different with my next question, but it is also uh, similar in a certain way. So I wanted to ask like personal trainers um, have the space to be specialists and space to be generalists. And I'm sure with athletes, the same thing happens too, right? You get to specialize or you just get raised and you're touching all different things and you're trying to play different sports. But let's stick with personal training. Uh, do you feel like it's better for personal trainers to be specialists or generalists in today's world? I know that uh, today is 2021, right? So things kind of got flipped on its head in 2020. So that might change the answer there. But um, what do you think in regards uh, to personal trainers, like having uh, that niche uh, or being generalists? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. That's a great question. And uh, my, my answer has definitely evolved, uh, for sure. Because, you know, it's funny, like, when I first got into it, I wanted to specialize. Um, and I kind of did as far as, let's say, performance coaching. But, you know, I think what mostly people understood when they worked with me is that you're going to work hard. Like, I mean, people would look at me like, I don't want to work with that guy because that client's doing things I would never want to do. Um, but the reality is that's what also gets you there, too, right? I, I don't believe in... You know, fitness is interesting because, like, if you give 80%, it's really not good enough. Um, sorry, let me, let, me, let me pause with that. 80% <laughs> is great. Any of you guys listening, if you're doing 80%, I am proud of you. Uh, what I mean by that more so is that, like, if you want to see this, this kind of curve of you consistently perform, improving every single day and you want it to be very linear, like I'm literally watching the process, you'd better be willing to give 100%. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's just what it's going to take. And if you do that, then you will see the results. And that's the best part. I think a lot of people think like, well, I've done enough. And, and you know, they're not happy with the results. And I think that's where you have to ask, can I give more then? Because that's really what it's going to take. Uh, sorry to jump off, you know, sideways there. Um, what I mean is, is uh, 
So like I looked at it as like, all right, do I want to do this or not? Do I want to specialize or do I want to be general? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more general people than there are specialized, specialized people. Sure. Uh, so my question would, would, would be to you is, are you really, really good some, at something that nobody else is or that maybe a limited amount of people are? Or do you just really enjoy doing something um, and it would just more be more fun for you to kind of do that, right? So, like, I, I can look at that because, I mean, I, I do train and coach hockey players. Uh, I do a lot of boxing and kickboxing, you know, and you can call it a specialization. And then I do a lot of those that are really, like, let's say I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to improve my max on bench, squat, deadlift. Um, but I've also got just, you know, older people that they just want to kind of keep moving, stay out of pain, stay healthy, you know. So my short answer is is – be as good as you can possibly be in all these areas. And if you're really good at one, more than likely people are going to pay you money for it. Man, I definitely agree. I found myself personally when I started um, doing training, one-on-one -on -one coaching and whatnot, I had a part-time job at a physical therapy facility, as a lot of these guys know. And um, I was almost, when I went into personal training space, I was almost like cast into, you're just going to do rehab work, right? And I found myself very bored very quickly because I was like, I'm not a physical therapist, but I'm sitting here and doing correctives for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour with people. And it's not necessarily bad work. It's good work because if you don't get it done, sometimes people aren't going to do it. However, it wasn't something that was driving me like it wasn't something that I was excited to get to every day. So I went and I spoke with my FM, PTM, uh, fitness managers, personal training managers at the time. And I said, I want to kind of branch out. And they said, well, you're really good at this. Um, we need somebody who can do this. I said, that's fine. But I do want to like look, have people do PRs and stuff like that. Like I, I didn't get that opportunity and I want to try to do that. Um, so then I started to branch out a little bit more. And then I found some sort of peace with that. So I think that having, like you said, if you're really good at something, maybe you should like, people are going to pay you for it. That's essentially what it was and understanding that, but then also having, yeah. you know, everybody else around you do um, some other stuff as well. Like branching out is definitely better. Cause I was only like 25, 26 at the time. And people were already putting me into that box with like, you get all the geriatric patients or clients. And then you get all the clients that have had torn this, broken this, broken that. And these guys know because they, they've all yeah, seen me on the mat. They'll see me on the mat for like a whole hour. <laughs> I just stay on the mat, you know? 6 a.m., yeah. same thing. You know, <laughs> in the morning, he's just looking at me like, fucking kill me. I don't right know. I'm, I'm young. I'm That's like, funny. See, I never really got to see that side. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> I can I can definitely see where it came from for sure, man, because I, I definitely respect the skills, but that's funny. I, I mean, and I can understand that because, like, you, you're doing a lot of the work, but you're not getting to have a lot of the fun, mm. you know? And what I mean by that, obviously, if you, you've kind of played sports or just kind of been very competitive, it is fun to, like, go after something, right? And more importantly, yeah. it's also fun to be a teammate saying, all right, let's get this. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. So I can definitely understand that. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's interesting to hear that take. And obviously, like I said, that was a side or that's a uh, that's a view I never got to see. So, yeah, yeah. It was uh, one that I quickly tried to clean up because I didn't want to give that perception, like stepping into a building. I didn't want people to see, you know, I, I used to wear like the, I mean, we could get into it all day, but I used to wear like the uh, the Tiger Woods gear because I had the little polo. There you go. Polo. Polo. Our time. <laughs> right. Easy oh, job. Yeah. And then everybody would be like, oh, with the shoes instead of khaki sneakers, shorts, you know, things like that. Um, but anyway, that was uh, so I, I learned my lesson real quick. Um, but anyway, I wanted to switch it up again, talking about like clients being ready, willing and able. So when it comes to guiding change and facilitating growth in a client's lifestyle, what are some things that you notice that translate to a client being well, uh, ready, willing and able uh, to change? All right. So we're talking about behavioral change theory here. Uh, that's a great question, and I think it's you know it's interesting, and obviously we've, we've kind of all been in in that in that chamber with Equinox, and of uh, you know had had to work through a lot of workshops with this for sure. But you know, I mean, I, th I think it's I, I guess it's going to take me a second to kind of basically structure what I'm going to say here, because uh, I, I do deal with this issue with with a few clients that I've had over the years, and it's been fun to watch them go through changes. And let's say go through the cycle again and again and again. And at each, each time they hit that, you know, that, that opening of like open-mindedness, they tend to uh, accept something or, or take a chance on something, you know, a new training protocol or just giving a little bit more or just, you know what, now I'm going to actually track my food consistently. And they give you a little bit more. Um, so that's a, that's a, you know, you got to kind of read that one. 
but I, I think you just got to kind of be a good, good coach and, and teammate and just let them know where they could be. Mm-hmm. You know, I think to, to get them there, you got to kind of show them how they would get there, mm-hmm. you know, open to like what it would be. You know, a lot of times it's just like, if, if I'm in the future with my client and I say, okay, this guy really needs to give me like two or three more days a week. If he really wants to start getting into his goals um, and rewind that back to now, okay. In our workouts, this guy's getting better at basic fundamental, like um, movement skills, right? So, all right, this is awesome. He's building. So he's becoming stronger. He's allowing himself to be able to do more. His workouts are becoming that much more effective. All right. In the future, I want him to start thinking, Maybe I could do another day here, you know, whether it's with me or it's on your own, you know, three days, maybe isn't enough. Maybe it's four, two days, maybe isn't enough. I, I always have been recommend, you know, any kind of strength training, at least three days, just yeah. because I just don't think there's, you're just not, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you're not doing that. Um, so I guess the buy-in is really just how willing the client is to keep going forward. And then on the other side, that's really going to come down to the trainer how good they are with their language, with their communication, um, with their programming, how they set it up, how they take those steps. And that doesn't mean it has to be like this perfectly laid out thing. Cause I mean, you know, I'm sure we all, we all know this that like, I'll mess it up a few times before I get it right. You know, client doesn't necessarily see that. Uh, and what I mean is like, okay, I want him to start thinking about this. Maybe I didn't communicate it the right way. Maybe I didn't show him what what it could be maybe i didn't give him the resources he need the right way mm-hmm. you know and that just allows you to say okay i'm going to come back i'm going to take a take a take a snapshot of what we're trying to do here all right here's the goals all right here's what he is doing all right here's what i think he should start thinking about doing and all right how am i going to get him to want to do that so you know what i mean that's the whole autonomy thing right you know allow him to kind of lead his own path um on the other side of that I will say, though, if you have clients that are are skillful, you know, and this is probably where I kind of would defer a little bit from the way we've kind of like thought of it in the past, is that uh, sometimes I got clients like, this is what you need to do. Good. Tell me. And they're doing it. Right. And they're doing it nonstop five days a week. I mean, like they're tracking their diet. They're hitting their program every day. You know, everything is just right there. They're, they're doing their, you know, their homework is what I call correct. It's like they're doing all the things every day. So like, for me to spend an extra two months allowing you to choose and me trying to coerce you to say what I think you need to do um, can be a waste of time as well. So then that obviously comes down to the, to the clients, just like I said, ready, willing, and able. Their skill level, where, where are they actually at? You know, what are they good at? If they're good at tracking data and they love doing this, here's what you're going to do, go. You know, if you're 100% resistant, how am I getting you to take that resistance down? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was going to say that it's difficult sometimes because we get caught in uh, the program, we get caught in what we want them to accomplish with their goals setting and everything like that. Like they'll say, I want to do this. You get excited, you get hyped up, they're hyped up, you're energized as day one. And then as the weeks go by, sometimes that luster just kind of like fades away. And you realize that the client might have been able to say what they needed to say, but they weren't actually ready, willing, and able to make the changes. Uh, that was really what you set from the outset. For example, like you said, like three days a week strength training. Um, they weren't ready to come into the gym three days a week. They thought they were, but you know, a lot of things were going on in their life or something like that, and they weren't able to hit that. And then everything else starts to fall apart. So um, it's interesting that you said just kind of see where the client is, be that guide for them, and try to help them. Uh, facilitate their own growth, but it is kind of difficult sometimes to know when is the right time for them to facilitate that change. Uh, and that's a great question. Um, and obviously a challenge, uh, I guess, you know, clean up what I said there is, is just have, like give them a, a, a goal post or a light post, so to speak. It's like, mm-hmm. this is where you could be going. Right. Cause if they're paying you or asking you how to get to a certain journey, certain destination, then I hate to break it to you, but there are some things that you have to do, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, that's like, don't sit there and look at every fitness model and be like, man, I don't want to look at like this when I say, Hey, you should probably do two a days and <clears throat> pardon me. And they work out for, you know, probably like three or four times a day, just so you know, that's not an easy thing. Mm-hmm. Well, but I want to do it in an hour. Yeah. And then more importantly, in that hour, you're, you're giving me like 
a 50 percent in- intensity rate right so it's like okay <laughs> probably not gonna happen but yeah it, it reminds me i think these guys are familiar um because we had a, a trainer on uh ag anthony gilks and his one of his clients was really ready, willing, and able. That guy said, I wanted to lose this amount of weight and this amount of time. And true, he knew it wasn't necessarily the most sustainable approach. And he had a short-term goal that he had to meet. He had to lower a couple of risk factors and get that stuff done. And this guy was in there at 5.30 in the morning. He did uh, half-hour sessions. Uh, so it was 5.30 to 6, but he did it five days a week. And he said, I'm going to maximize this for like three months, two months, three months in order to do whatever he needed to do. And that guy was getting after it. And AG was like, all right, if you're, if you're ready to go, like, this is what we need to do. And he had that conversation with him and the guy did not falter. He, um, but yeah, I don't want to take up too much of the yeah. time. No, Jacques and uh, David have some. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That makes it fun. So <clears throat> yeah. Definitely. I think uh, picking back off what you guys are just talking about when, again, going on the same theme of ready, willing, and able, because some some people we work with will say they want to do this. And like you said, once they realize that that fitness model or that fitness influencer does two to four workouts a day, or it's, you know, like I never forget reading, I think the rock, for example, or the guys like Hugh Jackman and Mark Wahlberg, they get up at 4 4 a.m. They do an hour and a half workout and they do their thing. They do another workout, whatever. So like the actual reality of what people do is sometimes not always not common knowledge to us, but Let's say we have, um, or if you have a client that starts working with you, or just even current clients, when they have several areas of opportunity, what do you like to tackle first? Say the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I guess the thing of that is usually, you know, it's, that's a hard, that's a, all right, I'm going to give you my opinion and then of course we can break <laughs> that down. Uh, and in my opinion is usually for the most part, I, I've tried to make everything as easy as possible. And then I really think that's when the exercise selection can really play a huge factor. And what I mean by that is if usually if somebody's coming in at this level, then they probably can't move well. Right. So like what I always kind of think is like, I trick them into basically working harder because most people will, will work to a certain threshold. Right. Like mm-hmm. they'll work to a certain degree. And then of course, when it gets a little bit too hard, they're like, all right, let me back down. And that's of course when they're like, oh, I need a break. Mm-hmm. And that's, so what I like to do is I like to push that line higher. And I do that by basically maybe it's functional or maybe it's just like strengthening the right areas. till all of a sudden their workouts are just now harder. Right. right? So like, they're all just like, they still don't really notice much because they're just in that much better shape. And that's, I guess, you know I mean? that That's kind of like, that's level one with fitness, right? Mm-hmm. Like, <clears throat> just improve like overall movement like capability so that's usually where i like to get them going and then i just like to make sure that uh or like to kind of just highlight their successes so that they see them you know and that's something that that took me a while to understand you know because i'm always like suck it up and get it done like if i I was talking to myself of like i don't really care what your problem is you 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 get get it done done or you don't yeah like the mahomes the new mahomes and uh a Palomaro commercial is hilarious to me. Oh yeah, because he's like, 100%. I eat one hundred percent of my green bean, green beans, one hundred percent of the time, and I, or, and I, one hundred percent don't like, like them. them. Yeah, and I one hundred percent don't care. Okay, that's right. Uh, so yeah. I love that because I'm like, I'm like, that's one hundred percent what it is for yeah. me. Yeah, uh, but it's not always the case for our clients. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be the hardest, most boring way. Mm-hmm. So I think really just identifying how they could have a better experience you know so i guess it comes down to like client experience and then trying to capitalize that on that because again just like we've kind of learned is like once we start having success at something we want more mm-hmm. right like barring no like real kind of like road roadblock or anything usually once we get the snowball going we want to see how big we can make it mm-hmm. you know or we want to make it as, as big as we possibly can 100 percent. so i guess that's how i would look at that Okay, cool. Um, yeah, because that's always, and I think you know, people could also speak to this that it can at times depend on the case as well. But I, I, I like your thought that I think that can be a common thing where if someone, as you said, doesn't necessarily move that well, and usually if they have a few areas of opportunity, there's it's 
there's so much going on, but I, I like what you're saying where just get them to move often or frequently. And then some of the habits where if they were eating some poor, if there were some poor food selections, the fact that they're so tired or they're so deprived of uh, maybe energy that I, so I have felt that there have been often cases where they would, you know, what, I'm so hungry. I'm going to eat fuller and better foods because I feel better. So if I am working out harder and I'm working out more frequently, like you said, if there's an intent, uh, increased frequency, there's less temptation, sometimes not always, to eat the less appropriate foods we're eating, right? A hundred percent. I mean, that, you know, I, I guess that's exactly kind of like a hundred percent agree with that. Uh, that's, you know, that's the idea of like, as you get better, you, you want to do better. You know, I, I try not to push too much in that. At, in the beginning, I think at, the, at that level, I'd really just be trying to ask questions and uncover what they feel would be areas that, you know, and we've kind of talked about this, obviously, with some of our workshops and mm. role playing and all the fun stuff we had to do. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, making sure you don't care more than they do, which is always hard, you know, especially if you, if you really get wrapped up into your, your client's well-being. And you, you, I mean, you do, you, you form a relationship with them. So sometimes... Sometimes you just got to take a step back and look. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. why I say just get them to highlight, you know, at the beginning, I would just be like, you know, how are you doing with water? Mm -hmm. All right. And usually more people either say, oh, yeah, I drink. I literally have a bottle with me all the time. Or, yeah, I know I can be better. Right. I, I really haven't seen too much in between. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you have people that just like drinking water or people that are like, you have to like twist their arm. And then it's, it's always funny because I'm like, dude, I love water. I don't know why, yeah. why, why don't you want water? Uh, but that, that's not everybody. <clears throat> so, yeah, so I guess it's just try to highlight what they could be doing. And, and again, try to give them a little bit of that autonomy. You know, I think that's kind of what I've learned. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. What, um, when it comes to designing a program, uh, for clients just in general, how do you typically like to lay them out, structure them? Very, very open, but I'll, but I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> what's your so style? It, it you know, how do you, how do you break it down? How do you like, what's your thought process for any of the trainers listening to this who might just be getting starting in the industry? They love hearing the different trainers uh, thought processes, you know? Sure. Sure. Uh, and this is actually a great one. And this is something that I, you know, I think we're coming out of a sports background, uh, having a program is something we just always had. Right. So it was like, this is how you're going to get there. Here you go, go get it done. Uh, you know, so that allowed me to really understand like programming cycles, sorry, meso cycles, macro cycles, and micro cycles, just like really understand why we break those down the way we do. Mm -hmm. You know, so definitely an understanding of those areas is just very, very helpful. But I've really just found is that you should have a weekly plan. You know, that's, I think, one of the biggest things. And you should understand how that plan ties together for the long term. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so that's kind of your micro cycle. And let's say you're in your, so yeah, your micro cycle and you're in your kind of macro cycle together. <clears throat> I think if you're doing that and then you're paying attention to some metrics, let's say you're paying attention to nutrition or you're paying attention to weight mm. or, uh, you know, you're getting measurements, right? Like I do think there's a lot of value, especially in, you know, kind of the way the world is right now uh, for trainers is that I do think using as much uh, technology or just metrics is great because it really does make a difference. It allows you to just kind of start looking at things and saying, okay, you know, I know what's going on here, right? Like, let's say I'm looking at, you know, my weight. Okay, okay, my weight's, you know, 230. That's great, well, it stays about 230. All right, what well, kind of wanna lose weight? You know, if I'm not paying attention to like my diet, how am I gonna know what that even means, right? Now all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm looking at that 230 and I'm saying, well, okay, I had 200 grams of protein, you know, 300 grams of carbohydrates and maybe 200 grams of fats. I was like, well, okay, maybe we need to dial down those fats. Maybe that's the reason you're not going down. Let's start there. So I think just having a starting point, like anything, that's what I would say the programming really, really does for you is it really allows you to funnel everything and do one, one solid direction. Uh, I don't think everything has to be, you know, I don't think you need a three month plan all built out a hundred percent, you know, unless you're selling that to a client, you know, in that case, that's a different business model. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're there, there's so much that goes into what you're going to do as a trainer in each, in each uh, session, 
you know, and how, how many times have we all had to deviate, change structure, change plans, and make sure that it fits for what the client needs or what's going on in his life right now. You know, so that's why I say, as long as we got a weekly understanding of what we're doing and we understand our overall goal, and then of course, limitations, opportunities, and then just really understanding our clients, what do they like? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like the end result is always making a fun experience for them because this is their experience, right? Training with, with us is something that they get to experience each day or every other day or however often they get to do it. So, you know, those are the things that I guess I would highlight as paying attention to. Cool. Yeah, I think um, I really like you touched on a point of you can plan three months out, but there's so much that changes. And we mentioned it, this previous trainer who had this client who had gotten a car accident, right? Like that's obviously very unfortunate, but things happen, things change, right? I'm sure a lot of us in February, probably March of 2020, had planned the rest of the month out, right? I'm sure a lot of us didn't have any idea what the rest of the month was, month of 2020 March was going to look like. And like you said, you adapt, you change. Um, I did want to ask one final question. I know you're a f um, fellow hockey fanatic like myself. Is there any, uh, both our teams got spanked last night as well. That's another thing. Um, I haven't not been, I've not kept up too much this year yet, uh, this season. Um, maybe not a bad idea. Yeah. I, I do need to get back into it. And it's funny. It's like, uh, I don't have a, I have a hockey site. It's a media site, personalhockeycoach.com. And, uh, so I, I kind of check. I mean, I, obviously you go there, it gives you all the, all the news oh, and information good. of what's going on. Yeah. So it's like, it's funny. I'm like, I was looking at that today. I'm like, you not even checking my own site enough right now. Uh, so <laughs> so, so I, I love the sport and I'm like, man, what are you doing here? You think, um, there is one day a job or a path that leads you into walking in, into, into a field with a professional athletes again in hockey specifically? Um, well, I mean, I guess so one aspect is going to be, yes, the, the site I was just talking about, that's actually going to be a, a training platform, um, where, you know, almost anybody can go to just get information to help them become a better hockey player or it helping, you know, just kind of any little inch they can give themselves. So I definitely see that as something there. Um, I don't rule it out, right. You know, that's one area, you know, strength conditioning. And of course, working with a sports team and working with pro athletes, uh, it's a lot of fun. It, it's definitely there. You know, but I guess kind of going back to when we first talked about specializing versus mm -hmm. uh, just general, you know, I hate to break it to you. You're going to make way more money if you're good in, in the general realm, mm -hmm. you know, so it's going to, you know, I mean, like anytime you kind of make your, your market smaller, <clears throat> then you got to make either bigger margins and people do. Don't get me wrong. People, you know, have one can train one athlete and that's, that's their meal ticket for their entire life. Uh, and so it's definitely out there and it's definitely something that I, uh, I see. I'm not sure yet, you know, so I guess that's the easiest and most honest answer I got there. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's cool. I, I know, I know that's something that's, uh, as you mentioned, those that are general may, maybe someone wants to make more money. And then being a specialist, this, the percentage of people that are, um, making, making it big, maybe even, or are successful, it might be in a smaller percentage. Um, but I always just think that might be, one of the coolest things right you work with athletes they like you said it's very interesting on the ready willing and able subject because they're athletes they want to get better they've been working on trying to get better since they were maybe seven eight ten years old whatever it is so and then a lot of these kids when they get they were talking about um lafrenier who the rangers drafted this year and they're saying oh he doesn't look that good and then with the, with the devils they, they drafted i think hughes a year or two ago and they're saying oh the fact that he's stronger is making his he's make he's being able to elevate his game. So they're talking about these kids have been playing these sports all their lives, but when they get to a level where they're playing with guys who've been playing professionally for 10, 20 years, some of these guys, right? That they, they need that extra level to be able to well to unleash their game. And what's what's lacking or what may be an error opportunity is their strength and conditioning. So oh, I that's just, a huge part. hundred percent. Right? Uh, yes, yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest things because you know most sports like you know football, basketball. Um, I think baseball too, they allow you to kind of, it's like, all right, now I'm going to draft myself in, right? Where hockey, it's like, it's roughly, you know, uh, 18, 19 to some 20 year olds. Um, I think it's a lot of 20 year olds now. So uh, you're a kid, mm. right? And the reality is like at 18, I mean, there are those that are out there. Very few 18 year olds are as strong as 24, 25 year olds. Right. You know, those guys that are like 33 to, you know, even 38 to 40, 
I think they can do well. They're probably still getting thrown around by them a little bit because they're just some some of the older guys that are just right. in there. They know they know what to do by now. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that's. I mean, there's a, there's a huge opportunity for that. And I think like a recession with the Reading Willing and Ables is uh, it's a lot of fun training people when the answer is yes to everything you're about to do or how are we going right. to get better, right? Yeah. They show up and like, I don't have to tell you today's one opportunity that's not coming back tomorrow. So today you're going to give me 150%. They're already there saying, what am I doing? Mm. All right. And they're going, you know, and then they're giving you everything they got. So, and when you say, hey, give me more, they find uh -huh. a way. So yeah. that's always that's always a great feeling from a coach because it's, it's a chance for you to kind of test your skills as well too. Right. Like it's like, all right, let's see what I can do with this guy. I'm about to make mm. a monster. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more before. Yeah. Wait, before David uh, jumps on, I wanted to ask because you guys uh, spoke a little bit about hockey and, you know, jumping into it at 18 and 19 and then having to fight your way with like, grown ass men pretty much right um how does that how does that work like is there a benefit to going in a little bit later because then you can have like a little bit more muscle mass on you a little bit more bone density like if you're a kid let's say you got a kid he's 18 and he wants to play in the nhl and people are looking at him scouters are saying listen i want this kid to be you know on this team or whatever in this roster what would you, what do you do? And then you see some of the guys on the team and you're just like, they're like twice the size. I mean, maybe generally they're not even at that stage. Maybe these are big guys. I don't know, like 18, 19 year old hockey players these days. What's I mean, yeah, 14 year old again. press 405. Like those are like rare. Yeah, exactly. so it's, it's Move ahead. Insane. Uh, no, a no, bench press 405, <laughs> 14 year old. He gets up out of the bench. I'm like, this fucker is a 14 pound, 14 years old. He's like, he looks old, but in reality, he's a young kid and he's one of those. Uh, you know, anomalies where it's like shit, sure, quick, yeah, yeah. a couple of them mature really quickly. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, so I mean, with hockey, I, I, I mean, again, the uh, the fortunate there, the you know, I guess the side of that is usually it is the bigger kids that tend to develop well, um, that do go on and get drafted right away. So definitely, I would say the first thing I would say is you should have started when you're 16. You know, uh, and, and I think most kids nowadays do. So I think you're going to see less and less than that. But it, again, you got a guy like Connor McDavid who comes into the combine and can barely do a pull up. Right. But he's put him on the ice. ice. He's the, yeah. Put him on the ice. He's better than anyone out there. So, you know, a lot of that, not only just getting pushed around by other other bigger guys is also safety prevention as well. Because obviously a guy that that's kind of that, that small is going to be, you know, it's going to upper chest and the shoulder is going to be a little bit brittle if he gets drilled by somebody who's 240 solid muscle. So there's a there's definitely a safety yeah. kind of protocol that goes into that. Um, I overheard you know, a first, uh, Sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, no worries. I was going to say my first thought, like on an eight-year-old, you know, parent saying, what should I do with my kid? It would be, you need to get a trainer, the right kind of strength and conditioning coach, and you need to give me a solid year of, an actual macro cycle, you know, mm. and that's with proper nutrition. And then these kids will do it, right? Mm. And this is what most of these kids do, right? Like, you know, if you get drafted and then, and I guess the other side of that, Angel would also is like, even though these kids are getting drafted, a lot of them are not getting to the NHL till they're 23, 24, mm. right? right? So it's only the, you know, maybe the top 10 Three or, through 15, yeah. maybe 20, yeah, exactly. Realistically, it might be 20, or sorry, it might be three mm. uh, for the first year or two, so. Wow, that's insane. That's a lot of competition, but you know, you got to earn it, I guess, right? Yeah, that's yeah, definitely it. Yeah, um, I, I had a question in, in regards to specific uh, sports and conditioning programming, since you have a lot of experience in it. What, what do you think, or do you think there's anything that's limiting a lot of these kids when it comes to doing, or when it comes to coaches giving them specific programs? Do you think there's a limiting factor that they're, they're, that's missing in a lot of these high school, college conditioning programs? If it, when it comes to like old school conditioning versus need the things that we have now? Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, I definitely think there's some things that are lacking, but I, I guess, you know, the old school conditioning, I would just see for the, I don't see it in the bigger schools and I don't see it in the, in the bigger programs. I see it more so, at, and you're kind of on the fringe when the reality is the only coach you got to teach this, you know, is somebody who may not be as well uh, educated and that's not to take it because could, you could go out there and find some of the best people in the world. So that's mm -hmm. not to take away. It's just taken as a, as a broad snapshot. There's just less willing people willing to, to kind of take that role. So you, you get stuck, you, you know, the opportunity goes to whoever's willing to accept it, I should say. Uh, 
you know, then, and that's going to lead to obviously, you know, some inexperience, you know, at, at a general level, you know, I think with social media and obviously with the way the internet and everything has been, obviously that gap is going to definitely get sped back up. So I would say with most good strength and conditioning programs, we can call them old school. I wouldn't say too, too much because, you know, I think people have to understand is we do a lot of this functional training, but if you're playing a sport, you're functional training, right? So like yeah. if you're very, let's say linear in your approach to getting stronger, you probably should be, you know what I mean? Like if we look at like, you know, Olympic lifters, some of the strongest athletes we have, they're very bread and butter. Uh, and, and that's how they stay safe. You know, the question is, I guess, I would almost say the opposite is true. And is that today's age, too many trainers are really excited about how they came up with a new method to mm -hmm. train someone. And really, I haven't seen a lot of them worked out in terms of actual overall um, sports and performance um, overlay, right? So, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, that's in a saturated market of fitness is there's so many things off, so many people offering so many things. And my question would be, what does it get me other than achieving your objective? Yeah. Because it's, it's exciting. Right. And it's something that you're doing and that's not to take away because there's a lot of like, great stuff coming out. You know, I mean, there's just more and more people getting better and better every day. You know, obviously in you know, the tide rising tide raises all ships for sure. I would just think we might run into more, problem now because everybody wants to get yeah, it's i guess you know it's hard to say it's a yeah. mixed bag you know i think it comes down to those that really are good at what they do and those it's a good i'm gonna leave that one alone uh, i'll say <laughs> no, it's a mixed i get bag. it i, I like yeah, i like yeah, how yeah. you mentioned you know functional like if you're doing a sport you're training functionally regardless just like innately uh, mike mike boyle said that if a kid wants to you know get better at a sport if a parent wants their kid to get better at a sport he generally would tell them go play the sport you know like, and then bring them into the gym and we'll or play other stronger sports. or play other sports but yeah exactly play the sports, the age, yeah. you know off-season training you have a lot of these kids playing football that are playing lacrosse in the off-season or or anything like that uh, back in high school i played lacrosse and the majority of kids that would come in were football players uh, that you know that are track and field um I wanted to change directions a little bit. In the beginning, I heard uh, from my co-host here that you have an experience in martial arts. Can you uh, maybe go a little bit into that and also explain how you would tie in some martial arts training into general strength training for clients? Um, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so I guess to kind of touch on that real quick, I've been a lifelong martial artist, uh, goji ryu, um, karate, and then Thai boxing, and then just... Uh, you know, I'm trained with the, uh, at the Grace Academy in New York, so jujitsu. Um, so really just a lot of wealth of trying to improve myself and learn from a lot of great people. Uh, so martial arts, I mean, the, the common theme of martial arts is just self-improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so right away, that's at the foundation of everything I do. And I think most trainers, that's probably the foundation of everything they do. And then uh, the other side of that is like, you know, I think we've seen over the past 10, 10 years just the evolution of how martial arts can be effective, right? Whether it's just, you know, stances or self-defense or just the mindset of, you know what I mean, like discipline over time, right? Like it's kind of 10,000 hours. Like nobody comes a, a black belt if they don't practice every day for a couple hours, you know, two or three hours, right? It's a 10,000 hours thing, you know? So I think that's always applied in fitness, um, discipline and uh, what I what I like and what's going on and you know in the past let's say 10 20 years is the understanding of like the mind body connection but more importantly how meditation and just discipline over your mind can really help take away or re alleviate like anxiety or just fears of being able to be successful um, you know I think what we don't give enough credit to is a lot of people that just don't know if they can actually be successful. We think it's like, no, just do it, right? Like, no, you can do this. You just have to believe this, right? But when you're generally internally, you know, worried, can I actually do this? Am I gonna make the right choice this time when, you know, history has shown that I wanna go hang out with my friends and have that drink, right? Like, how am I gonna get over this? So I think understanding and practicing mental discipline just from a different avenue, as opposed to just always in like, hey, be strong, be disciplined, don't do that thing we know you want to do, right? You know, so it allows them to just kind of practice and almost get your reps in. 
So I think that's probably the biggest strength martial arts has. And then, of course, boxing and kickboxing, because it just gives people another avenue to have fun. You know, I think that's why we've seen a huge rise in both those, because it's fun, right? Like, and I, and I, and I know that for myself, you know, I was kind of touching upon this with uh, and kind of just kind of going over some notes before, before the podcast. And that's like, I always do sports with my fitness <clears throat> because otherwise I'd get bored, right? Yeah. I always like that I'm like trying to work towards something or have fun with something and that I can basically overlay that uh, that fitness goal as well. So that, that just helps me stay motivated. Uh, yeah, I think that pretty been, much Have you been it. training uh, even with the pandemic going on? Because I know a lot of places in the city have been hit pretty hard when it comes to uh, martial arts training. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so my thing is I've, I've done this for so long and I've had to do, you know, katas and shadow boxing and, you know, just paddle drills and, you know, hours upon hours of stuff that, I mean, I did want to do it, but let's say it was tedious at times. You're like, oh, come on. Man. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I've had no problem, you know, luckily I've got a bag and, and I, I tend to, you know, play on it consistently. You know, I, I try to go in and out of places that don't have too many people. Um, luckily we've got a field house and a turf. So I've been, had some fun training with that kind of stuff as well. So I have not had, I guess that's a two sided answer. It's been a challenge, right? <laughs> the, the pandemic's been a challenge for all yeah. of us. Like I've just got to think back. I'm like, no, you had to get creative many times. So let's not, not get too carried away. Uh, I guess I found a way to be successful. And I think, you know, going forward, you know, people keep talking about how home fitness is here to stay and home fitness was already here. Right. More people are just yeah. understanding of the, you know what, there's a lot of benefits if if I've got 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes, what if I just did something versus saying, can't get to the gym and back, so I guess I can't mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that's where you're seeing a lot of opportunity, and I think there there is going to be, like, this part of the, the industry is definitely going to shift, so I'm excited to see where things go. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, I, well, I, I was, my bad, I was uh, going to just make a joke, like, it's easy <laughs> Like home fitness is one of those things that has been here. And uh, I think the next phase is for people to figure out if they can deal with like having the gym equipment in their apartment or their home, like visible or not, right? Because there's a, there's been this test of boundaries with 2020, like not only with fitness, but also with work yeah. and, you know, people calling you at all weird hours and emailing you nonstop. It's like, that's a real test. Like, do, can we get over this obstacle of not having boundaries or are we just going to get stuck on not, um, on boundaries and say, all right, I don't need this in my apartment. This doesn't belong here. This belongs in a gym. So I don't know. I got a few ideas on that that you just kind of like brought back to mind. Um, maybe they're more valuable than I thought. Um, but yeah, that is like interesting. But I, I do feel that too, because I think, you know, that there are those clients, obviously being in New York, that are like, man, I, and I literally have bought and yelled at them, but they're like, I have all this stuff in here. <clears throat> like they're, they'll be excited when they can get rid of it, right? You know, so I think you're gonna have a lot of people that are just like, there's gonna be the rubber band snap, snap back effect, but it's just gonna be like, I need to get out, you know? I was one of those people when I first got to like pick up a, you know, a, a squat bar to do some deadlifts and some cleans. I swear people thought I was probably crazy in the gym. And I'm, at, and I'm like, I'm just like, I'm getting amped up. I'm like, wow. I'm like, my body was just like, this is amazing. So I, I definitely think there'll be a snapback. But um, no, I was that... people were just probably like, this guy's crazy. And I was like, can't stop myself. Body says go. So. <clears throat> Nice, Dan. Um, where where can we find you on, online? You know, what, do you have any websites, and any resources that if anybody has any questions, they could, you know, reach out? Sure. Uh, I mean, the easiest probably way right now is just going to be at Instagram at uh, Dan Rohanna. Uh, my email is staystrongathletics at gmail.com. Um, and then uh, that would probably be the easiest way to go about, about finding me, you know, or just Google me. Cool. And hopefully good things pop up. Do you have any, do you have any projects coming up? Uh, so I do actually have a, a, a fitness product coming out. It's coming out um, around April 1st. It's the Bonsai Ball. It's uh, <clears throat> light load sensory training. Mm -hmm. So it kind of really hits on. Uh, oh, bonsai bonsai yeah. Ball or Bonsai Ball? Bonsai Ball. Okay. The Bonsai Ball. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it really kind of hits on, like I said, uh, brain health, uh, regeneration, and uh, body awareness. Right. So things that I think we all understand that everybody could, could use. And, I mean, it was just a project that's taken – a long time to get to know and understand what it was and how to how to get it out um but like i said uh april 1st will be watching so i'm excited about that <clears throat> that's awesome yeah. 
congrats on uh, awesome. creating that and hopefully everything goes well and we'll be sure to promote it when it's around that time just yeah for you to let us know. awesome man. i appreciate 100%. that guys. Yeah. thanks for being with us dan all right thanks, yeah, dan. thanks for having me guys it was awesome yeah all right see you guys later. all right take it easy yeah thanks dan take care that was awesome right. man yeah, it was cool. I got Banzai check the... Ball. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to check that out. See what what's it about. No, it's gonna be dope. That is gonna be dope. I didn't know that he. Um, I know that he was doing Muay Thai, but I didn't know he did karate as well. So that's pretty. He's cool. a man of many trades, isn't he? He has a lot under his belt. Yeah, and I like the fact that he was ready to kind of like push his clients and say, "Hey, listen, this is what I need." Or this is what you need, and this is where this is how we're gonna get to it, right? I mean, that's kind of like that people, no right? nonsense, yeah. and that's yeah. um that's a good approach to have. I think that right now we're in a weird spot because everybody's talking about how they feel and you know trying to understand their feelings and things there's like nothing that. Nothing wrong with talking about your feelings, Angel. No, there's nothing wrong. I mean, trust me, I know I'm probably the most empathetic one here. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Um, but I do. I do really like that approach of just like, cause that's how I deal with stuff internally. I think externally I'm more empathetic, but internally I'm more just like, go get shit done and stop crying. Yeah. I think that's, and think in my opinion, internally for everyone, it's great to have that mindset. You know, I think internally it's great to be like, I got to get this done. Let's do it. I think that's a healthy way to go about things. And I think from a coach to a client, I think a lot of it has to do with being there for them when that mentality isn't there does that does that make sense yeah yeah you know it's like you want to encourage them all the time yet a couple i mean in my opinion a couple of times it's great to be like all right dude what are you doing come on let's go let's go get it done yeah but a lot of times also they that switch in their head when it comes to oh i can't do it and then like dan said earlier if you tell them well do this do that it's like wait no it's like it, it's not not clicking so i think yeah. it is a big thing that we needed to you know, help them be empathetic with whatever's going on in their life so that they themselves could be like, okay, let's get shit done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just like, um, the previous episode where we were closing out and, um, I was talking about my client who wants me to hold him accountable by just asking him what foods did he eat? And, you know, he'll reflect on that and how I felt like that wasn't a good way, a good approach because then it could be destructive, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, that's what some people need and understanding that and being able to communicate that and be able to wear that hat for a little bit for that person. For a little bit, yeah. You, you don't want to be able to, you don't want to hold their hands like throughout their yeah. life. Yeah, it's true. I know, I mean, listen, we all know some trainers who went out and got groceries for their clients as well, right? Where they're just like, oh, their client doesn't have enough time. So then they're doing it. It's like, well, you know, they're adults oh, that, too. Oh, that reason why. I, was, I thought you meant by pandemic. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I was like, oh, I totally, I totally go. I, I have a friend of mine that I used to get groceries for because she was like, like oh, no. older. <laughs> she was older. She, you know, she was, she had so many, you know, prior risk factors. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll get your fucking groceries. You Not meant, saying you can't get them. But yeah, sure, right prior is like, you know, she was like, oh, prior convicted. Who knows? You know? Who knows? I mean, that's why she doesn't want to be out. Who knows? <laughs> With the mask, it, it, uh, she can't, she's banned from Cinderella. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the image that's search the with the mask. That's the same mask you had when you robbed us. <laughs> no. No, but uh but yeah, this it's good to be able to hold people accountable and you know push forward. He worked his clients hard as well. When we were when we went on, yeah. I remember seeing he busted his clients' asses, right? In a in a yeah. functional way. It wasn't a very yeah, it was it was all very functional, very strategic. And um I think when um whenever i had conversations with dan he was always very just transparent which is something i can always appreciate with him and he yep. always um everyone that you went through the curriculum with you have some it, as you've mentioned in previous episodes where anyone that took the curriculum or anyone who still wants to you usually get that mindset or that combination of um it, it's just it's just those similar wavelength com- of thoughts and conversations that uh i think like you said again in previous episodes that have had the pandemic having not being these daily con not having daily contacts and conversations of everyone we used to you f- you forget that those are some of the connections you've we've made and it was always good to reconnect with someone like him um Definitely. yeah he's in pennsylvania now he said right yeah well you guys want to hear something funny but I got to be, so, be funny. I swear so that. one, David, you can't call me Fern anymore because I passed my citizenship on Wednesday. Let's go. Very right. nice. But you guys, so so now we gotta call you Jack. 
Jack. <laughs> Do you guys want to hear the funny part? Oh shit! What? I almost had a. This is completely down to me though. No one else's fault. So when I got the letter about a month ago, I said like, you'll come for interview two to four p.m. <laughs> so address is the Jacob Kravitz building, right? And I had a real moment. I was like, oh, Javits Center, right? I didn't even think twice. I didn't Google the location, nothing. Um, so I get the Javits, because everyone's telling me that the Javits Center is where the vaccination is going on, right? So I'm like joking, like, ha I get the vaccination and my citizenship in the one day, boom, 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 whatever. I get the Javits Center and I see all the signs are vaccination this, pro this way, or this is the exit, or this is the entrance. And I'm starting to walk to the Javits and I look at my letter again and I look at the address. I'm like, um, where is the, where is this entrance? So I Google it. <laughs> this shit is on the Lower East Side. Yeah, and I'm by the Javits Center and I have 15 minutes to make my appointment. So I'm like, I might not get my citizenship because I didn't <laughs> read a fucking address. But anyway, long and short of it is the Javits Center has those bikes. Uh, the city bike dock and I got an electric bike I was about and to say dude, you better hop on an electric bike I or a never just rode brace. so yeah and Keep I that actually, shit on pause don't even <laughs> don't even lock it up just pause I'll be right back so I throw it out the dock yeah. it was just so I almost was like fuck am I gonna yeah. miss it and then like it's whatever I make and I think it's one of those where you don't ever go it's not as though oh you're not here at 2pm you're done we're sending you home but I was trying to joke to people that asked me, oh, how'd it go? I said, not good. They're sending me home next week. And no one bought the joke. Was I not convincing enough? No. But, uh, well, yeah. They don't, they don't turn. That's not how it works, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not like, it's not like they're going to be going, hey, pack your bags. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> you imagine. So, but um, maybe to Hispanics, but not you. Yeah. And then it's not funny. It's just. Yeah. Like, and then it's like, oh, shit. Damn, they deporting you? Shit. So, yeah, but I learned you guys want to hit me. You want to quiz me on American politics. Now I'm kind of, kind of, uh, clued up on it. So, uh, what were the original 13 colonies? Oh, shit. I know, uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, North, South Carolina, Virginia, Maine, Massachusetts. Um, did I say Pennsylvania already? Um, Maryland. How many was that? That's that 12. Good. I think there's one more. I think I'm is it Delaware? Delaware is yeah. I think it's just Vermont and New Hampshire, are not the two. Yeah, okay, cool. I think. Any more you want to pep me, David? Come at me, oh, bro. David, Vermont, Vermont David, was on. afterwards. Vermont was a whole thing. Come at me, bro. Come on, David. Want throw me to one. test you? Throw Give one, me one question. One. Right. Throw one question my way. Uh, first uh, three presidents. No, nah, that's too easy. Actually, I couldn't name you the second one. I can name you the first and third one. Name them. Uh, George, <laughs> George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are the first and third. The second one, I never. Um, well, wasn't it John Adams? Wasn't uh, he the second president? I don't fucking know. Uh, second know. president of the United States. Or James Madison. Joe. James Madison's the fourth. Okay, so it's John Adams then? John Adams. Samuel Adams. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things that Americans don't really know. Well, you wouldn't. I, if you asked me a similar test in the that was based on the UK history, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you much either. So. Who gave us the Who gave us the Statue of Liberty? French. There you go. Thank you. Oh, uh, what uh, what uh, material is the Statue of Liberty made out of? Oh shit! I couldn't tell you. Isn't it copper? Jack. 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 I don't know. This wasn't on the question. This wasn't on the quiz, <laughs> so I'm not able to answer it. Sorry. Um, no, but I do think it's copper. Because it, it was rusty. Wait, so you don't have the answer? <laughs> no, I don't have the answer. No, what, the thing is, what, I, just what know. I read is it's copper since it, it's green because of the rust. Right, it's green because of the rust. So it was originally like brown or whatever. No one knows though. That's the thing, right? It's like no one... I mean, they know because they you can just sample the metal and just figure out what I it guess. is. But that's that's what it was. And there's another Statue of Liberty, right? So the French, la the French, eclorante monde. What the fuck? That's how you say it. David, uh, Angel's got some uh, liberty in lighting the world. Send it to me. I'll read it in French for you. It was a I'll reddish brown copper skin. Wow. Copper, copper statue. They have a small one in France as well. They have a smaller version. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. What other question? Uh, 
Then we'll wrap it up because I want to bore you guys. No, 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 no. No, this is actually kind of fun. I mean, it is fun, but <laughs> listen, I got wrap it in five minutes though. But yeah, uh, all right, five uh, ten minutes. Now Washington, Jefferson, and Adams. So that was that one. So I got yeah, I got one and three right. Yeah. yeah. There you go. No, you got it. T- wait, John Adams was the third or the second? It says the third. Second. Third. Nah, what? Oh, wait, John- oh this- now you know which one you got this- wrong. No, nah, this is brain mass. So this isn't even. Nah, go to US. Go to US CIS. What it's called. Uh, so yes. Tom George Washington Jefferson uh Washington's the first yeah right and he's the he's the father of America wow yo I'm going through what this site told me this is question what was question was George Washington a British commanding officer shit I actually couldn't tell you that it's a trick question because he was but that was before they became the 13 colonies he was technically working for the British uh see and thank God that was on the test. <laughs> go, no, go, yo, go on over, go on YouTube whenever you got a chance and type in oversimplified. And they have all these videos on uh, like, the revolution and the civil war. It's really cool. Oh, isn't that one on Braveheart and they rip Braveheart's accuracy? I think, no, yeah. no that's different. That's different. Oh, that's that's different. different. Okay. But go to this one. They have like cartoons and everything. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. So Washington was uh, 89, so 17. 89 to 97. Adams was 97 to 01, 1801. And then Jefferson was 01 to 09. So I was right. So uh, Washington, Adams, Jefferson. Thank you, Wikipedia. Make sure to donate to Wikipedia as well so they can stay alive. They've been hit pretty hard because of the pandemic. This is a shameless plug. <laughs> uh, so but anyway. The trainer feed. Fuck. What do you. <laughs> the trainer feed. <laughs> All right. So let's wrap it up. And we'll catch you guys next time. All right. Be safe, guys. Bye, guys.